Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at Tamiya's 1 to 48 scale F16C slash N. Really been looking forward to this kit, so let's see what it has to offer. Hope you enjoy. So, as per most kits these days, this kit starts off in the cockpit. This is a really nice cockpit and it also features these really nice panels which uh, just kind of slot into place. I like how they are detachable and I did make use of this that by only sticking them down with blue tack. Once it was stuck down with blue tack, I gave the entire cockpit the base coat of this medium sea grey which I thought was quite a good match. And then I popped them back out and as you can see here I'm doing the detail painting of the instruments. Um, having them detachable uh, and having the actual side panels detachable just helps to get so much more detail and so much more precision when you're painting. So. Really nicely thought out there by Tamiya. All of these instruments are being picked out using Vallejo's black. I really like this colour as it is a pre thinned It's actually meant for airbrushes, I believe. However, it works really nicely when brush painting. It has a really good opacity. Once I'd picked out all of the required details, these panels were then stuck back into the cockpit tub really nicely because we have these um, nicely designed location tabs for the panels where it just allows them to almost be slid into place and just a joy to make this part of the build. I then went on to uh, put in the final parts of the cockpit. This is the, um, the flying or control stick, the throttle and also the rudder pedals. The rudder pedals were a little bit fiddly to get in, however with a little bit of patience they do get into place. So it was then time to highlight a couple of those lovely details on the uh, instrument panels and control panels. Uh, to highlight them, I used a dry brushing technique. Um, you might have just seen me slip my brush away there. That's because I had too much paint on my brush. Uh, the way to do a good or a realistic looking uh, dry brushing technique is to make sure that you have almost zero paint whatsoever. Um, but anyway, the dry brushing technique worked really well. Um, did definitely give another element and a nice amount of detail to be seen in the cockpit. So it was then time to move on to another sub-assembly, this time I'm working on the gear bay. So the gear bay is uh, located on the underside of one of the air intake parts. Um, however, despite this potentially being a bit of a tricky location to, to build up details and to build up a nice looking gear bay, Tamiya did manage to provide a very easy and a very detailed representation of the gear bay. Do be careful though as a couple of these parts can be quite hard to understand where they go and what places they go into. However, if you take your time, make sure to really study the instructions, you'll be able to get everything in with no issue whatsoever. So I really appreciate Tamiya taking the time to mould quite a few elements here as separate items. I know several manufacturers to reduce the amount of parts in the kit would uh, probably try to mold let's say the uh, you could see the hydraulic fluid reservoir there they tried to maybe mold that onto the gear bay already however Tamiya took the time to mold it as a separate part which I, I think it's a nice detail it's a nice it's a nice addition to the kit so it is then time to make up the first part of the air intake uh, these go together using a sort of tab uh, mechanism it works well um, however, you do need to be careful, um, definitely just take, take your time with these sort of bits as alignment is key. Uh, but if, if pretty much with Tamiya kits, if, if you are going to take your time, they are going to treat you right. Like it's a Tamiya kit, it's going to go together brilliantly, but you just have to take a little bit of time with it. I then mounted the cockpit tub on two very prominent and very nicely placed location tabs on the bottom aspect of the fuselage went together really nicely. I then uh, mated the gear bay slash intake part with the bottom side of the fuselage as well. Once again, nice big location tabs and pins, so it wasn't an issue. After that was done, I made sure to let it dry and then I um, connected the one of the upper halves of the fuselage. This was the, the later part or latter part. Um, and this went together nicely, however, as you can see in the video, some clamps were required just to give um, a nice strong bond because it was a little bit springy. Uh, however, if you've got some clamps or if you've got some masking tape, this can be sorted out incredibly easily. Then the forward bit of the fuselage was then connected on. Once again, 
nice nice location tabs and nice location pins so there wasn't any uh, fit issues there wasn't anything to really worry about which is expected from a tamiya kit there are then a couple of pieces to be put on the nose. Do make sure to read the instructions carefully here and note what version or what scheme of the aircraft you're doing as some of them have different nose, not nose cones, but nose sections. I think some of them have like the anti-static or the, the, the little fins on the front. I'm not too sure what they are, but just be careful. There are then a couple of panels which have to be put onto the aircraft. These went in quite nicely if you weren't like me and actually got the orientation of them correct the first time. After that there were the air brakes which had to be put on. In my opinion a nice addition to this kit if they were going to redo it in the future which I'm sure they're not because this is a really nice kit but if they had um, the ability for their air brakes to be um, extended because the F-16 has quite a unique type of air brake so it would be nice to show that off. Whilst I was rambling on about air brakes you could see me mating the undersurfaces of the wing to the top half of the wing. Once again it goes together very nicely however clamps would be required just to make sure that you have a really nice tight fit. So it was then time to go on to the forward air intake. You have to also make sure that you remember to do all of the nose wheel um, gear bay section as this is also attached to this sub assembly. Here you could see me putting in the, it isn't a splitter, it's actually there for support for the air intake and it's also apparently got some anti-ice mechanism on it so that splitter will heat up um, and you know melt any ice on it which I thought was an interesting touch. You have then you have sorry you have then these two um side pieces which then encapsulate the air intake and then there's one or two more pieces which have to be put on the tolerances for this kit are very very small so it does make clean up off of the sprue very very important um so yeah just make sure that you have a new scalpel blade before you um attack this kit because you know that you are going to have to make sure that all of your parts are 100% you know clean and don't have any bits of the old sprue on them. So for the version that I was doing it meant that I had to uh, actually take off these two bits off of this part. Uh, this was done just using a scalpel blade and then I used I, I, I can't even remember but a certain grit of sandpaper just to sand the detail flush and make sure it looked like the rest of the model. So this sub-assembly then can be snapped into place on the rest of the fuselage. Went in very nicely, it had a nice sort of indented or recessed place where you could put a bit of glue and then just stick it in there. I then went on to fitting these fins onto the underside and they have very nice tabs which are at the correct angle. So, you know, if you do know the F-16, um, you know that these fins are at a very specific angle and Tamiya managed to take this into account by um, already having the tabs in the correct angle. So, you know, just an, a nice touch and nice that Tamiya are thinking out for the modeler. There are then a couple of chaff buckets and antennas which have to be put on and a couple of air intakes which you saw me take um, putting on, sorry. These will go on very nicely. There's uh, no, no issue um, with any of these parts, I think. In the entire kit, I don't think I could find one issue with a certain part not going into place correctly or needing modification. So I know there is a bit of a debate why our Tammy kit so expensive, but once you've actually made one, you kind of understand that you're, you're paying for the not only the quality of the model, but the quality of the build, the build quality and the enjoyment behind it. So these um, pins which you can see me using here, they are actually supplied in the kit. I had a couple of questions about, oh, do you need to buy these pins? No, 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 they come with the kit, so do not worry about that. Speaking about previously the, the quality of the, the model and stuff, having these metallic elements and like these pins and screws within a model, it just, I don't know, it makes it feel more durable, more secure and just, you know, a higher quality. So it's it's a debate which will go on for a while but in my opinion Tamiya is worth the money you can see me there just putting together the um, the vertical stabilizer interestingly it didn't um, follow the usual sort of approach to doing this where the um, 
vertical stabilizer is sliced directly in half. This time there was almost two sections and one encapsulated itself, which was a, a much better way of attacking it, which meant there wasn't any seams or any gaps along the, the ridge. Here you can see me building up the lower section of the tail. Um, this went together nicely, however, it, it went together, uh, but it was quite fiddly in areas. So um, I just, I think my tip here would just be make sure you let each component dry. If you're using fast set cement, just give it maybe an extra minute or so before you start going on to the next part. Also, once this was done, um, and when I tried to put it onto the fuselage, um, because it uses these rubber grommets, like through the pins, it's a little bit spongy, if that makes sense. So here you can see like how spongy it is, and it's almost like pushing it away. Um, once once held there and using some, you know, almost tack welding it on with uh, thin cement, it did it did stick down. So this kit unfortunately features a mold line or a seam line down the center of the canopy. To sort this out, I'm using the following tools, a scalpel blade, a high variety of high grit sandpapers and Tammy's polishing compound. So I initially started by just kind of scraping off uh, the large amount of the plastic which was on the mold line. Then I used um, all of the different types. So started at a low grit sandpaper, then worked my way up then use the Tamiya's polishing compound just to buff it out. These were then masked using my usual technique, my toothpick technique. Uh, you can watch some previous videos if you want to learn about how I do that. And then these are, they weren't glued onto the canopy, they are just resting onto the canopy because the, the fit is so good, you can just kind of push them on there and they will stay. With the nose cone uh, firmly cemented onto the fuselage, that was the main construction done. Here you can see that I've just used some Tamiya masking tape to uh, kind of stick these in place um, because as you'll see in the future, you, you can't stick this part down yet. However, I wanted everything to be painted in one go. So the first bit of painting that was going to be done was going to be me using Ammo's One Shot Primer. Once that was done, it was time for a new technique. Here I'm, I'm using these kind of, I know it said salt weathering stencil, but I'm using it as a sort of mottle stencil as per se. Um, so I just used this on the entirety of the model. It worked really well. You just kind of press it down, give it a light coat and, uh, and, and move on. It is so much quicker than what I usually do. If you've watched any previous videos, you know that I like to do the pre-shade mottle effect, which is it definitely takes a while. I think it is worth it, but it definitely takes a while. This is a much quicker process, and as you'll see, it does the same sort of thing. So to start off, um, I'm going to be doing the scheme that was seen on the box art, which is a tritone arctic looking camo. So I started off with the medium sea grey. Uh, as you can see here, I'm, I'm not being too worried about having a really tight camo here, um, just because firstly it's the first colour, and secondly, if you look at reference images, which I can ping one up on screen now, uh, it, this camo isn't incredibly tight, it isn't a sharp camo, it's quite a soft camo. Um, so I, I had that in the back of my mind when doing it, albeit that, that is not an excuse for me having uh, <laughs> inadequate airbrush skills. Uh, however, when I was painting all of this, it was done with my usual sort of philosophy that I go with where you don't go too heavy with the coats, you kind of outline where you're going to be painting, then you fill it in using some very light coats. When I'm doing this, I also like to every so often take a minute, step back, have a look at what it looks like from a distance or in different lightings, just to just to see if it looks natural or how if I'm losing the um, salt weathering effects underneath. Uh, so I do recommend you do that, I think it can definitely help you um, understand what your model is going to look like at the end. Other than that, it was um, it was plain sailing really, I did this with all three of the colours, so it was medium sea grey, insignia white which I used on the gear bays and intakes, and then also black. When talking about paint manufacturer, for the white I used Vallejo's insignia white, for the black I used also Vallejo's black. Uh, and then for the medium sea grey, it was actually ammo MIG. All of these are airbrush ready. However, I'll talk about this in a second, but the black, in my opinion, was a little bit too thick as it was a little bit spurty, you know. 
the the as you can see here if you if you look quite closely you can see how sort of the, the edges are a little bit spurted which it wasn't really what i was going for however you know I, I did try to rectify the issue with the weathering later on in the build as you'll see so he can see me just you know trying to fill in the black uh, i'm not trying to get rid of all of the um the white under and the mottle underneath just because you know it's very hard to make black aspects of a model look interesting uh, I do another thing to make sure it looks a little bit more interesting in a second. However, j at this point in the build, I was just trying to make sure that I, I kind of have elements of a darker grey um, and just a pure black, you know, j just, to, just to give visual interest to the model. I know some people like to use NATO black when spraying black. However, I like to use a pure black at first and then lighten up certain areas with um, not a NATO black, but I, I like to use an equivalent to NATO black to, you know, lighten up and bring a bit more interest later into the build. So here was the Tritone camo all completely finished. Uh, there was the top side, here's the underside. I was pretty happy with how I did this. I then went on to spray the nose cone. However, look, I get a little bit angry that there was overspray. <laughs> um, however, this was sorted out just by, you know, spraying over with the black again. So not a real issue, but... Then you can see this is what I meant by brightening up a couple of the areas. I didn't just do this for the black aspect. I also did this for the white and the, the medium sea gray, but with different colors. So for the black, I did my usual sort of mottle effect by spraying um, a very highly diluted white into the middle of the panels and then going back over this with a black. This just uh, highlights the centers of the panels, just gives some accentuated panel lines and, you know, just a bit more of visual interest as you'll see in a second. I did this exact same sort of technique, however, um, in the medium sea gray. However, there I used a very light gull gray, I believe, for the middle of the panels. And then for the white, I used a similar sort of white gull gray. You can't really get any brighter than white. Um, so you kind of have to do the opposite effect. Uh, you can kind of see hopefully that effect there. If not, I'm sure you'll be able to see it in the final photos at the end of the video. I highly recommend doing this to a couple of your models. Maybe not all of your models because some people don't like the technique. Uh, but I, I think it just gives a nice faded paint or just, you know, a bit more interest to the model. However, I know it is quite a, um, it's a bit like Marmite, this sort of stuff. You either love it or you hate it. However, I do actually quite love it. So it was then time to add another another level to the model this time using the salt weathering spray again with a very highly diluted white and just really dusting it um just to give a couple of these little outlines it, just just another element it's all about layering uh, i think with a model and you know with a, how if you can build up enough layers it will it will eventually look good uh, at least that's going to be my philosophy so with the uh, exhaust here, I'm using AK Extreme Metal range. Um, the F16 exhaust has these sort of, um, I don't know, it has two different types of metals on them. One is a very a much darker one, which you saw I, I masked off where that should be. And then I sprayed it with a darker metal. However, I don't think it was dark enough. It's still, you know, it, it, you can see the difference in metal. However, it should be, I think, a little bit darker than that. But, you know, I was happy enough with it. And then I just continued the rest of that sub-assembly. There's some nice little notches uh, that Tamiya provide here to make sure that you get the um, right orientation of the exhaust. Um, just making sure. Also, this part here is a little bit of a struggle to get in. As you can kind of see me just chucking it in there and getting it around. I then ended up just poking it in, as you can see in this clip. Uh, be careful though, because I did actually scrape the inside of the paintwork of here. So... Maybe wait until your paint is completely dried or give it a gloss varnish before you try that. After that was done, this uh, assembly was then snapped into the back. Uh, once again, finding a corresponding notch to make sure you get the right orientation of the part. And then finally, you get the last bit of the exhaust. Once again, finding the notch. <laughs> so there's a lot of notches, but it makes it makes the modeler's life a lot easier. So once again, good engineering from Tamiya. So it was then time to go on to a bit of masking of the wheels. Initially, these wheels were given um, the insignia white. Actually, it might not have been insignia white here, but it was a white of some sort. And then you put some masking tape over them. Then you get a uh, pencil, hopefully a bit sharper than this. Trace the outline of where it's going to be cut. 
then you get a new um, um, exact blade or scalpel and you just kind of firstly just score around the outside and then actually commit and uh, cut the whole way around this is a cheaper alternative to um, wheel masks are they as effective no probably not um however if you're modeling on a budget a little bit like me then this is a you know it's a better alternative and look it you see it does a good job and it only takes about 15 minutes overall i did this with the red to the wheels and also you might be able to see here i actually um sanded a, a sort of a weighted spot onto each of the wheels uh, surprised that Tamiya didn't actually supply this as a sort of base or bog standard, you know, out of the box. But, you know, it's easy enough. Just grab yourself a sanding stick and rub like hell <laughs> with the wheel. Um, so that was the wheels done. Then they got um, cemented onto the main gear strut. Um, really nice fit here, actually. Uh, I know quite a few kits these days have issues with their landing gear not being strong enough and the connection points not being good enough. I had this issue with my F35, which was my previous video. Uh, since then, the wheels have actually, um, or the you know the points have actually kind of sunk in a little bit, which wasn't brilliant. But time you've got this spot on here by giving a good point. So some further points to populate in the gear well. Uh, these are actually very important pieces. Make sure these are on correctly as these are the connection points for the um, the gear bay doors which will go on in uh, you know in just a couple of steps. There's also a few struts and stuff which have to get put on. These are actually really good. You almost did I hope you saw on video there there was like a snap into place which is firstly very satisfying and two makes you very very confident that you've done it correctly. <laughs> So this brilliant um, process was followed on into the nose wheel bay. Once again, really nice, just smooth process of getting this all together. Um, but pretty much after I'd done this, it was time to move on to a little bit of chipping. I didn't want to overdo the chipping here, but I wanted to do a few chipping aspects on a couple of the access panels where there would be, you know, ground crew, you know, maybe pulling them up and having a look inside of them quite frequently so didn't do much but I, I did a little bit of it then it was time to put on a couple of pylon well this isn't really a pylon but it's you know outer wing pylons um I wasn't actually going to put any missiles um, or ordnance onto this kit why I'm not too sure I wanted it to look quite clean however the one thing that I did put on it was a fuel tank this was a centerline fuel tank and it was first given a coat of um, medium sea grey. Oh, don't know why the plane just fell in the background there. Um, and then I came in with an ocean sea grey and just tried to simulate some chipping. So first I use a brush uh, to get some of the, you know, more specific chips. And then I get to do some sponge chipping, which I'm sure you get. You just get a sponge, you dip it in some paint, and then you, you know, dab, dab, dab a little bit around. I was actually really pleased with how this effect looked. Um, the only th thing I could think about to maybe improve it a bit was in the inside of some of those chips was to add a, a fleck of metal metallic color maybe that look a bit better um, then this part here was cemented into place I made sure to put a pin in there and um, if you are going to put a fuel tank in there make sure you put a pin there um, otherwise it won't be able to you know the, the fuel tank won't have anything to connect onto then there is a pylon that has to go on and then you put the fuel tank on um, it doesn't tell in this specific kit it doesn't tell you how to do this um i just knew how to do it because i have actually made one of these before back in oh september uh, last year um you can see that on my instagram my instagram is you know pretty pretty simple to find it's just mac models um so yeah if you if you want to know how to maybe do things it does include all the parts for literally every single variant of the f16 so you, you can muck around with it a little bit so as you saw in those previous clips, I was just putting on a couple of the gear bay doors. These have really nice connection points, you know, like it's just, it was nice. It was, it was very Tamiya. It was very easy. Uh, but with that, that was pretty much everything all sorted on the model. So I gave it um, a gloss varnish using Vallejo's gloss and then all of the decals were put on. I didn't film any of these because they're Tamiya decals, so they're quite thick and they're a bit of a pain to get down. So I was like, you know what? We just have to have full focus on getting these decals to go down nicely. I did get them down nicely. 
took a lot of micro set, uh, a lot of micro sol and a lot of tears, but it was done. I then gave it another gloss varnish and it was on to weathering. So I thought it was good to start with uh, weathering the white, uh, sorry, the black first because that was going to be the hardest thing to weather. Uh, to do this, I used um, a white oil paint wash, which I, I mixed up just using some white spirit and white, um, yeah, sorry, white oil uh, paints. Once that had uh, done, I just brushed it onto all of the panel lines where the black is and all of the certain details. I then let this to dry for about five to 10 minutes, can tell you exactly. Uh, and then I wipe it off with a, a, you know, an old rag, which I use. Um, and as you can see, that white just collects into all of the recessed panel lines, uh, which is what I was looking for. Um, you know, because before the the black just looked very stark, you know, there was no, there was, you couldn't really see the panel lines. So bringing in this white, or you could even use a really, really light gray um, oil paint, it just, you know, helps. As you can see, I did that with the rest of the model, and then it was time to go on to a bit of streaking. So uh, that isn't the streaking that I think all of you are used to knowing about. I mean, oil streaking. Woof. Um, close call there. Uh, pretty much you just get a couple of dots of the oil and put it along maybe the panel line which you want to do Then I get a bit of masking tape put it over it So I'm not gonna push any of the oil backwards and then I brush in the direction of airflow Streaking really easy to do however really really effective so I highly recommend I then did um, a bit of um, you know, a bit of a dot filter, if you've ever heard of that phrase, is pretty much get a couple of dots and then you kind of blend it in. Um, I did that as well. I didn't do that all over the place. I only did it on a few select panels. I then repeated this streaking process, uh, but this time with the, the darker paints uh, on the lighter surfaces. So I think I used, oh, it wasn't burnt umber here because that's too dark to be burnt umber, but it was a, it was a brownie sort of paint. Um, and that was that. So then it was time to use VMS's uh, gloss varnish just to seal in everything I'd done. And then I did a little bit more weathering, this time using burnt umber. Uh, and I just kind of darkened a couple of the panel lines. So to do this, I, I firstly put down a layer of white uh, spirit. Then I come in over the top just by, as you can see in this video, dabbing a couple of the burnt, the burnt umber oil paint around. Then I get a little bit of white spirit again, just to you know make it a little bit easier to blend in, as that is what I'm going to be doing in the next clip. And here you can see me just blending it in. Um, this was my first time doing pretty severe weathering. Um, I was quite happy with how it turned out. This is more of an artistic approach though to modelling because, let's be honest, I don't think many planes look like this in real life, or if they did, I don't think they'd be flying. However. I like how it looks and that is all that matters and um, so I did that on a couple of the um, panel lines as you can see uh, here, here's just a little video of me kind of showing off uh, where they are and then to finish this off and seal it all in I used VMS's matte um, varnish there you go um, just to seal everything in and uh, you know because it isn't it isn't a glossy play in the F16 it's very very matte so that was that. Then I um, painted up the figure and the ejection seat. This was my first time painting a figure, so I didn't film it because I didn't really want to, I didn't really know how it was going to go. Uh, but if you want me to film how I do my figure painting in the future, do let me know down below. This then gets, uh, you know, just pressed into the cockpit tub. Uh, there you go, you can see a bit of a snap there. I don't think I positioned the arms correctly though, because at the moment they're kind of up in the air, like they just don't care, which isn't really what I was going for. But anyway, um, then a couple of the final touches was putting in the, the heads up display. The control panel is also connected to this part here, uh, which was good. Then I demasked the canopy, um, put this part on. Um, you have to make sure you, you might have to do a little modification to that part if you are going to have it in the close, the canopy in the closed position. Then that part is just uh, put into, there's two holes at the back of the canopy and you know, that that's it. So here it is, here are the final photos of my take on Tamiya's F16C slash N. Really enjoyed this kit. This is the second time of me making it and I enjoyed it as much as the first time couldn't recommend this kit more. 
So I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think down below. I'm always open to a little conversation. And I will wish you a happy Easter and I will see you next time. Bye bye guys.